Has everybody had enough coffee this morning? Somebody say no. You better get some more. I, I'm, I've got a whole bunch of stuff that, that uh, we're going to cover today. And, and some of it is, is preachy. Some of it is encouragey. Some of it is uh, coachy. But um, I'm, I'm really digging it all. And I, I can't wait to share it with you. Uh, last week, Pastor Sharon had this brilliant take. And I, I committed it to memory. And she talked about how the Apostle Paul, at the end of these three chapters that we've been going through, that have been pretty thick, she talked about Paul taking us from theology to poetry. And I thought, man, what a, what a great way to express that. Because the last three chapters that we looked at, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, were pretty thick. They were theological, they were sociological, they were philosophical, they, were, they, they, they kind of bound all these things up in the question of how do we handle this divide between Jew and Gentile, and what does it mean, and how does the law apply, and where doesn't it apply, and what about grace? How then do we live? That was the question. And some of the things, some of these nuances between Jew and Gentile, we, we understood. But as Sharon mentioned last week, a lot of this is still a mystery to us. We may never understand it, and it's not urgent or necessary that we do. But, but in the beginning of chapter 12, we have this Paul, Paul of theology and poetry, turning into the Paul of praxis. Praxis is a great word. I love throwing it out because it's Latin and it makes me sound smart and it gets you 15 points in Scrabble. I happen to look it up. But praxis means the process, the process, not the instant, the process by which a theory, lesson, or skill. So, so what, I've, what I believe, what I've been taught, what I've been shown how to do, how all these things become enacted, practiced, embodied, or realized. How do I take what I know about my Christian faith and put it into practice? And if you're new to the Bible, or you're just maybe unfamiliar with it, there's a real strong chance, and I'm, I'm convinced of this, that you're going to find Paul's writing over the next few weeks incredibly encouraging and motivating and freeing. These are some of the greatest things ever written or said that unleash the potential of the church and its people. It explains the beginning understandings of how we live the Christian faith, the, the praxis. Now, Stephen Marcy had this uh, beautiful salmon fishing trip coming up uh, outside of Astoria. And there's this place called the Columbia River Bar. It's where the Columbia River slams into the Pacific. And at this point, it creates some of the most dangerous and powerful forces in the world. We have these two opposing currents in this fight, this give and take, this back and forth, coming to a head, each one pushing its dominance toward the other. And as they collide, it creates this incredible chaos. And navigating through this channel, this Columbia Bar, from, from one to the other, whether you're going in or whether you're heading out, it's dangerous. Depending on the tides, the season of the year, the weather, it is extremely dangerous. And the same things happen in spiritual ways too. Where the ethics of the world, where the common practices of the world come face to face with the Christian faith and the way of the kingdom. And we do this walking around life that we have. We go to Walmart, we go to Napa Auto Parts, we go to Sherwin-Williams, we go here, there, everywhere. But underneath our feet are these colliding ethics, this, these colliding ways of living life. 30 minutes into the news, you turn it off because you've had it. Seeing the ethic that you live by contested by the ethic of the world, right? We get frustrated. 
But where two things collide, it also creates opportunities. Where the dark meets the light. And navigating through this, this channel, where the two collide, can be difficult. And Jesus dealt with this constantly. I mean, uh, where the ethic of, of the Jewish faith met the ethics of the kingdom. And in the biographies about Jesus' life, he came up against it. And, and he, he would remind them that this is what the world has said. This is what your Jewish faith has taught. You have heard that it was said. When you read that in the Gospels, this should make you pay attention quick because he's going to contest it. You have heard that it was said that this is the way to righteous living. And then Jesus would offer the kingdom's countercurrent. He'd say, but I tell you. The world systems have taught you this. The kingdom of heaven has something entirely different for you to consider. Something new to show you. And this current of the kingdom, it, it runs contrary to our natural behavior. We have to begin thinking a new way. And this is Paul's task as he writes today. We, we have got to engage in thinking a new way. We have to adopt a new praxis. We find a number of things that Paul addresses in offering the Christians of Rome a new way of thinking. This countercultural, kingdom minded, kingdom founded way of life. And here's the first one that he goes into how we worship. How we worship in the kingdom is much different than how the world worships. Now, the Greco Roman world and the Greco Roman culture that Paul lives in and writes from within practice practiced a sacrificium. And it sounds like sacrifice, doesn't it? Well, yeah, that's exactly what it is. They made sacrifices to one of their dozens of, of pagan gods. And of course, with any sacrifice, the highest degree or order of sacrifice that you can give is a life. The sacrificial taking of a life. And animal sacrifices were very, very common in the, the Greco-Roman world. In fact, one of the debates that you remember Paul found himself in among the Corinthian church was, should we eat meat that was once sacrificed to one of these idols? Because as the priest would bless the sacrifice and the animal's life was taken, I mean, it creates a bit of a profit center. You skin the animal, you butcher it, you take it to market. And the question among the Corinthians was, should we, should we buy that and use that if it was once offered to an idol? But there are also records of human offerings. What I didn't realize until this week was, you know, sometimes it would be the life of your slave. It would be the life of a cripple. The life of the dis diseased or, or disfigured. They would even sacrifice the life of a disabled child or a child with birth defects. And only in extreme cases was it the petitioner himself in order to please his God or, or show his devotion might sacrifice his own life. The practice wasn't common, but it wasn't uncommon either. And, and it's against this socially adopted practice that Paul offers the Christian way of true worship. This is what he says. He says, I urge you, I, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because we have been recipients of God's grace, this extraordinary grace, off your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Because in, in the kingdom, living life as a living sacrifice is your true and proper worship. Because we're not, we're not serving a God who needs constant appeasement. He doesn't need the appeasement of our empty rituals. We serve a living God who's given us his love and his mercy. 
We're not serving or, or making an offering to an idol. Our God's alive. Our God loves. And our God calls us sons and daughters. And for the Greeks, this, this kind of practice, this what they refer to as worship, had nothing to do with adoration. This form of worship was a transaction. In their minds, if I do this, if I make this sacrifice, if I give this gift, God will give me back what I'm asking for. If I do X, maybe God will do Y. Maybe he'll be less angry with me. Maybe he'll be more inclined to bless me. Maybe he'll just simply leave me alone. And when you look at it this way, this isn't worship, is it? It's a desperate attempt to coerce their God into getting what they wanted. It's an act of selfishness. But a living sacrifice, a daily life that is laid down for God's purposes rather than your own, that's totally different. A daily life where you put God first, a living sacrifice, that becomes something productive in this world. A life of service, thanksgiving, worship, love, love of neighbor, care of others, fidelity, integrity. That's different. That is not self-seeking. That's a living sacrifice. So then Paul writes, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't be taken in by their idea of what worship consists of. Don't do that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the transition of your mind from thinking the world's way by the world's ethic to the kingdom and the kingdom's ethic. And as the Spirit changes your perception of real life, as you get glimpses into the kingdom and what God is up to and how he's asked you to participate, your mind does change. The Spirit's at work. He changes your practices. He changes your hopes. He changes your dreams. You begin thinking in new ways. And you find that your will, your intellect, your moral compass start to shift. They, they start pointing in God's direction rather than the world's direction. Sometimes almost imperceivably. But those things that used to have a hold on you don't anymore. They've loosened their grip, and as you face forward and face God and become a living sacrifice, sold out to his purpose, life changes. And as a result, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You begin to gather an understanding of what God wants for you and from you and through you and through you to the world the second thing that Paul contests here is sober thinking. He goes right into this. For by the grace given me, because God has given me this, shown me this truth, and, and trust me with this message. I say, and he's not selecting just a few people to, to send this to. I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves right here, right now, as God's child, with sober judgment. What's he mean? He means candidly, factually, with sound mind and not swayed by your feelings in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Think of yourself soberly with good judgment. The Roman culture that Paul's writing in was, was uh, a lot like ours. It was obsessed with self-promotion. It was the selfie culture before a smartphone. They were really high on themselves. Oftentimes their selfies consisted of entire murals across the interior walls of their homes, painting them in some epic battle or doing some great deed. I mean, they were massive. Sometimes it was by statue. In fact, they have uncovered some... some uh, sites in Greece where sculptors had hundreds of body figures of both men and women 
but they didn't have heads on them. They sold these as they were commissioned to people who wanted a statue of themselves. You would, you would uh, go visit the statuary, you would talk to the artist, he would sketch you out, and then they would put a head on one of these bodies that they had stacked up. Business was that good. It was a selfie culture. They were all about self-promotion. <laughs> you know, we'd never go to that extreme, would we? Except that if you're a football fan or a, a college athletics fan, the biggest thing right now is called it's NIL, Name, Image, and Likeness. You attract the finest talent to your university by what you can pay them for their, we're not that far away. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But here's the catch. We're not to think less of ourselves either. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. See, sober judgment exists on both sides of this equation. There are just as many people, and I think in my experience in church world, there are more people with a poor self-image, people who downplay their strengths and gifts and abilities. People sit in church week after week believing that they have nothing to offer the kingdom. They have nothing to offer God. They, they don't have the talent. They don't have the ability. They have nothing. And it's simply not true. Thinking too highly of yourself is not sober judgment. Thinking too poorly of yourself is not sober judgment. And quite honestly, for some of us, this part of our mind's renewal, this part of our mind's transition into seeing ourselves as someone of value is some of the hardest work that we will ever do. We're thankful that the, the Spirit takes it on. Looking on ourselves with sober judgment, if we're all puffed up and prideful and, you know, all into the, the selfie environment, finding some equilibrium, sober judgment about who we are and who God has called us to be, that will be some of the hardest work we will ever do. But it's necessary. I mean, taking that long and sober look at yourself and thinking, you know, this is what I've always told people about me, but it's, that's not right. Admitting that somebody else can do that job better than you can. That's hard sometimes. It challenges my ego. But the inverse is true also. You actually do have the talent. You've got the ability. You can do a lot of good in a certain area of service and you'd love to do it. I mean, it just comes so easily to you. And I can think of, I'll just mention them. Shelley. Those flowers, brilliant. Michelle, cooking, delicious. Things like this that, that just come so naturally and so easily. And, and Marcy leading worship and Sharon as she teaches. And we all have gifts and abilities. We can do this. And most churches are full of people just like this that continue to sit on the sidelines. Have you ever sat down and done this hard work, looking at yourself soberly as God's child, right here, right now, what can I do, what can I offer, what can I bring? Have you done it? Have you been one of those people that, that makes claims about yourself that your abilities don't match? Like this. I got an F in art class for my CAD drawing and I'm still wondering what the problem was. I'm an artist. Right? On the other side, have you ever looked at yourself soberly and hopefully? And you got this feeling, you know, I really enjoy this. This is what I love to do. I hope God can use me. God, I'm a living sacrifice. Use me. Or have you just let those nagging and, and condemning negative thoughts hold you back from giving the kingdom the best of your best. 
your life, your skill. It's a living sacrifice. We have another meme that Zach will put up here in a second. You know, I have a lot of hidden talents. Like what? I don't know. They're all hidden, right? As a son or daughter of God, why not be proud of who he's created you to be? Why not earnestly seek that position that he has carved out for you? Paul says later on in his writings, God's prepared work for us that only we can do. Why wouldn't we chase after that? After all, we're a living sacrifice. That's our true and proper worship. And as individuals and as a church, we have to soberly examine ourselves in light of not what we think about ourselves, but who we are in Christ, what Christ thinks of us, and find our place in the flow of the kingdom current here in Caldwell. I mean, if God's someone who's called us to some great task, like dinner church, and then he empowers us to take that on, and then promises that there will be no lack, we have no excuse. We can't sit idly by when our neighbors are hungry and they're living in spiritual depravity, but they don't know it because they're just moving along with the ethic of the world. We have to soberly, as individuals and as a church, examine ourselves in light of who we are in Christ. Our self-image, I mean, whether it's as individuals or as a church, can't be dictated by our feelings. I mean, how I, how I feel about my abilities. A lot of those feelings are dictated by the world. How does that work? Well, I can do this, I can do this, but I'm not as good as them. Or I'd really love for our church to do this, but we're not as big as they are, so I guess we can't. See, we let outside influences determine what we will do and how we will minister. We can't do that. A lot of times our, our feelings are based in the world's ethic in the world's currents and we're trying to navigate between the, the kingdom and the world and that channel gets pretty narrow doesn't it and a lot of times as we're kind of bouncing around in that channel we can't trust our feelings our feelings are real as pastor sharon says but they're not always true we feel them but they might not be right. And in a sense, we have started to try to find our security, our way of being in that person who's going to tell me I've, I've done a good job rather than the king who's going to tell me I've done a good job, good and faithful servant. Our security comes from being and living in Christ. God gives us everything we need to accomplish his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And, and at the same time, not just accomplish his will, but enjoy it. It renews us, both individually and as, as a church, as each one of us find our lane of service and then stay in our lane. This is how it works. God won't ask you to do the work that he has laid out for a sibling. Are you hearing this? Are we there? One of the, the, the great things about the gospel is it says, you do you. Be yourself. Be who God has created you to be, not somebody else. You do what you're good at. You do what you enjoy because God has carved out that path for you. He's just waiting for you to step into it. You do you, I'll do me, together we build the kingdom. The third thing is we are one body. And here's where 
we have one coin and two sides of it. So, so hang on. Paul says, for just as each one of us has one body with many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function, those of us who find ourselves in Christ, though many, form one body, and each part belongs to all the others. Each part belongs to all the others. You, is there a hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven? Are there five-star Christians and four-star Christians and two-star Christians? And There is a hierarchy in heaven, and it goes like this. It's Jesus and then everyone else. That's the hierarchy. See, the, the, the ethic of the world says, how do we rate in, in a scale of dominance? Who's holier than I am? Who, who controls the moral high ground in this argument? But the kingdom sees in terms of faithfulness, not dominance, faithfulness. None of God's children and none of our churches are esteemed more highly than another. Why? Because we all kneel before the same king. Every one of us rely on the same grace. Everyone receives our forgiveness from the same God. Every one of us is anticipating the same resurrection. It's not about us, it's about him. We're united under a single king. Male, female, slave, free, Jew, Gentile. Our salvation is in Christ alone, no matter who we are. And we're all being renewed, transformed and renewed by the same spirit. And the other side of the coin is, that's exactly where our sameness begins and ends. Because we're all different. I mean, if God, this creator, created us, each and every child with a unique eye pattern, a unique DNA, a unique fingerprint, don't you think it's possible that he gave us all different gifts and abilities? Why? Well, to take on the different tasks that he's assigned us to. I'm sorry, Pink Floyd. We are not just another brick in the wall. We are unique, much-loved children. How boring... I was going to say, how boring would parenting be if all of our kids were perfect? Then I got to thinking, that sounds pretty good. (laughs) That's not boring at all. I mean, I'll take some of that. We form together the body of Christ. Body in the sense of, of being his church, his people. We are the ones that bear his name, him, his image, and his likeness. If we're going to brag about something, that's what we brag about. And no enterprise, even, even churches... Don't just run on their ideas. They don't just run on their good intentions. They run by a willful adoption of a strategic intent, meaning they identify what God would have them do, and then they do it. And it takes all of us. It takes each and every one of us. Part of our strategic intent is to soberly judge ourselves our abilities, and then that sold out, willful, deliberate act of radical following. Come hell or high water, deliberate act of following. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us by the same God if he's going to create different DNA for each of us, if he's going to make my iris different than Sharon's, if he's going to 
give us all unique fingerprints, if he's going to do this with snowflakes or blades of grass or sunrises and sunsets, he's going to give us different gifts and abilities. Just because our corporate identity is in Christ doesn't make us identical. Sharon's getting a lot of airtime this morning, but she had to make some cookies for a, a, a library event this afternoon. And as I walked using every bit of my willpower this morning out of the house and left them there, they looked very lonely. But if I were to examine them, no two cookies are the same except that they're made of the same material, the same dough. That's the characteristic that they share, not the way that they look, but the fact that they're made of the same substance, just like us. Just like us. Finley, what's wrong? Absolutely. See, God created us with this, these magnificent differences. And our differences aren't just nice, they're essential. You are not just a brick in the wall. You are different. You were made with your purpose. I was made for my purpose. This church was established for its purpose. So giddy up, let's do business. Business is the mission of advancing his kingdom in this world, starting, this is ground zero. This is where it begins. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. The same grace that's given to Marcy to power her gifts is the same grace given to Glenn to power his gifts, and on it goes. We are the same substance, same spirit. So Paul says, you do you. Become a living sacrifice by doing what God has built you to do. Not somebody else. Do what he's built you to do. Find the work that he has called you to do. God made you to be you. To become that part of the body that is uniquely you that is missing when you're not part of it. Then Paul offers this non-exhaustive list just to give a few examples. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If you are born to teach, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to give, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. The whole list, whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability because you're a living sacrifice. If it is to do mercy, if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the great heavenly God-inspired message to the church. You be you, but be it to the best of your ability. Give it your best. Be the living sacrifice that I designed you to be, whose place no one else can take. Now, before I get excited, let's look at a few things. There are things that we can do. There are things that we ought to do. There are things we must do. When we think about this, this dinner and this, this family night coming up and its way to reach into the community, we all have can-do things. I can mow the grass. Is it a, is it a God-given gift? No, but I can do it. There are things that we can do. The dishes, the setup, the greeting, the cleaning, the, of course, in, inviting people, and, and the preparation that goes into this. So others can work teaching, instructing, ministering, building relationships. But then there's also the ought to portion of this. We ought to do certain things because there's a need, and, and I've, I've got no reason to say no, and I... I I could wash the dishes if I had to. I can invite people. 
But here's where we have to find this, the sweet spot. And this is my prayer for all of you. It, it always been this way. What is the must do? What is that thing that God has called you to do in light of what we've just looked at this morning, in light of your gifts, in light of your inclinations, in light of what you enjoy doing, in light of the fact that your sober judgment has said, yeah, you really do have some chops in this area. We all know what we can and what we ought. We have never declared what we must. When I first uh, left the business world, got into church world, they called me pastor, but I wasn't. I was what they called an executive pastor, which meant that you went in and you kind of ran the enterprise. I mean, you managed budgets and, and payrolls and uh, HR and advertising and all, the, all those things. You handled the business side of, of a church. But after about six months, the Spirit showed me some things and said, I have some things you must do. Totally different than things I can do or ought to do. These were things you must do. Have you ever soberly, using your best judgment, defined what God has called you to? What shows up on your must-do list? What is it? And what's stopping you? Who has gotten in your way? Has it been the, the self-talk? Has it been that you, you started once and it didn't quite work out and you didn't get the support that you felt you needed? What belongs on your must-do list? What is that thing that God is calling you to that is part of your uniqueness, that, that the part of you doing you? As I said, we are, on the, we are on the verge of something new and spectacular, I believe. And I've told everybody who will listen, the first six months are going to look like they're not going to look good. As we get this figured out and we find a rhythm and a tempo and we find our place and as all the pieces come together. But we're going to stick with it. On one hand, we're still working on that homeless or homeless day shelter project that's percolating over here and and we intend to have folks that would uh, participate in that shelter environment come over here on Tuesday nights where they can build relationships and we can build relationships with them this is all part and parcel of the same movement what's on your must do he's promised that the resources are here when I brag about you guys, which is often, I tell my colleagues that I have never been in such a small church with such capable people. I mean, you guys are, you guys are the top of the class. Absolutely the top of the class. It's time to mobilize and get on with it. Next week, we'll come back to this, this question of what is it I must do, but we will, we will look forward to that. Be in prayer this week. Ask God to help you identify with, with sober judgment, not thinking too highly or, or too poorly of yourself. What is it that he's got for me to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for for your forgiveness. We thank you that there's no hierarchy in your kingdom other than Jesus first, Jesus only. And the fact that you would call us into this incredible enterprise of the church, the fact that you would offer us meaningful ways to serve your church, is so encouraging and so motivating and so uplifting. To know that we have a seat at your table. Father, speak.
speaking of seats at the table, we pray for those who have not been through the doors of our church yet. We would ask that your Holy Spirit would be visiting homes in our neighborhood today. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Father, what we're asking is for you to make people hungry, both physically and spiritually. Help us to be the friends that they need. Help us not to be standoffish. Not to blame, well, that's just me, I'm an introvert. But Father, may your, your spirit work in our hearts as it works in their hearts to create bonds of friendship and bonds of sincere love. Father, help us to know our neighbor, not to see them as the other, but as people for whom Christ died and that Jesus loves very much. We come to this table this morning again today, Father. It proves Christ's love. Thank you, God, for big dreams. Thank you for promising to supply all our needs. And we believe that means that you will be moving in the hearts of people to get involved, to bring their best gifts, to make each day one of living sacrifice, holy and pleasing perfectly acceptable to God. For your goodness, Father, we say thanks. We pray this in your